All right, we're a quarter past the hour. And so without further ado, um, a man who needs very little introduction to this group, but uh, I'll just point out that we're extremely happy that we were able to coax a uh, world famous astronomer into the world of cancer. And um, he's been a fantastic new perspective for all of us and really done some terrific things. He's working with the Hopkins crew. He's part of the uh, MCL consortium officially on the, the Hopkins grant and also working with the Koya and working very closely with Janice Taub, who was a guest speaker here in this workshop a couple workshops ago. I can't keep track. Um, and Alex has been a consistent um, partner with us in the workshop and trying to improve on what we're doing um, with respect to really doing a robust um, and um, you know, a, a data accurate way of providing uh, a good picture of the tumor immune microenvironment. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Alex, and you can give us the, the update and um, let us yeah. know when we're gonna see that paper. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So our goals were, so I tried to list a couple of high level goals why we are doing this. So to make the flux data coming up the images more quantitative and reproducible so we can not just use the fact whether a cell expression is positive or negative, but we can actually set up possibly multiple tiers, which is one thing we have been extensively using uh, in, in, in our science paper. Then also try to record spatial information on all levels, including you know tissue, tissue level, cell level, and even morphological components of so the membrane cytoplasm and uh, nuclei. And altogether, combine all this data to create a flexible, scalable database, actually a hierarchy of databases, and then menu, maximally automate the processing, because if we start to scale out, it's really everything that is that involves humans is incredibly painful and and as we discussed in the chat, it is not necessarily as reproducible as an automated processing. And the goal is to create data sets with the cardinality of multiple billions of cells. And in the process, we would like to allow the maximum use of spatial information. So how can we use the annotation regions and geometries to define the tumor microenvironment so that we can define different dynamically assigned different buffer zones. Then we basically compute for each cell the positions, but not, not only just the centroid, and, but, but also the, actually the precise geometric shape described as a polygon. And then we pre-compute proximities to the nearest neighbors within 50 microns to each cell <coughs> for speed. And then we also compute the distances of each cell from the different annotation boundaries to, to enable the selections. Then we also realized after a while that we had to create a customizable visual access to the database so that we can see all this complex information in context. And then while this visualization interface is kind of created for the typical things that everyone wants to use, then it cannot do everything for everybody. So how do we solve the everything for everybody problem? That we simultaneously make the database available through a collaborative framework where people can write their own R scripts and Python scripts, or actually plug the data or various subsets of the data into the different AI framework. So PyTorch and TensorFlow. And we have the, we created the size server for astronomy, but actually now it, it supports things from natural language processing to turbulent flows, wind, so wind turbines and, and cancer. So state of science paper has been accepted. We are waiting for the page proofs, but it's, but the end is within sight. The code to be used is all the code that we used is being moved to GitHub and documented. And this is very painful, I can tell you. So, and almost all the MATLAB code that we use has now been converted to Python and turned into a single Python package that will make it much easier and portable. Actually, we do at this point, much of our processing instead of Windows, we can equally well, the whole code runs as well on Linux and we can set up virtual machines and submit tasks. 
so it makes it easier to scale out the processing. The CellView, the visualizer interface is now in a beta version. So we have been already using it for debugging actually some of the data, even for the validation cohort for the science paper. In many ways, these things that we are doing now are less glorious than before. So we are kind of putting one foot ahead of the other. In, and so we need to create a more formal workflow process that also involves the, and tracks the staining and, and the scanning and all these steps. We created a hierarchical organization of the, both for the data and the code, how it can be organized into modules, hierarchical modules. So the data is partitioned into cohorts. The cohorts are kind of created into projects, then slides, but in between there are actually batches where the batches are processed in the same way chemically. Uh, then there's the code is organized into workflows, then the workflows are broken down into tasks and steps and phases. I will show actually some diagrams about those. We have been logging everything, but it's very painful also to look at a lot of log files and a lot, lots of lines in log files. And generally, if we want to find the bugs this way, we are going to miss them. So it's important to create kind of a real-time system that shows again in a hierarchical way the whole status of the system at any one time with as little delay as possible. So right now we are still harvesting the log files, but I would like to go over to real-time transactions where each of the log messages are automatically inserted into a database. We are starting to dive into Motif and Proxima. So we are working very closely with Cliff and Peter we are preparing for a very un variable number of markers and adjacent cuts and how to represent all of these in the same database. So right now we still assume in all our databases, we have a fixed number of the eight layers or so the seven markers actually. So it's DEPI plus six markers plus autofluorescence, but potentially in the future we can very easily, so I already have a database schema which enables a variable number of markers. And then we are in the meantime scaling out our storage and computing and processing capability. So I, I will show some of the details. So the workflow development, we have multiple high level tasks. The first is how to characterize a new microscope, which actually is circular. We requires an initial processing of several slides so that we accumulate a critical am amount of data so that we get away from the, the idiosyncrasies of individual, what the tissue layout is on individual slides. So we need to have a representative big enough data set so that we can run a stable microscope characterization. This gives us basically a warping and flat fielding map. Then once this is logged in, we have to using the best characterization, we have to reprocess all those slides and all the others in the same batches. Then we do the unmixing and segmentation. From this point on, this is done on a slide by slide basis, which is important. This means that we can run things in parallel. And for the segmentation, we are still using the Akoya inform with our own extensions, where we, where we, I will show actually the workflow diagram, but the idea is that again, we run inform separately for the tumor cells and the immune cells. Then we do the phenotyping, and this means that the same cell may be phenotyped more than one time. And then we merge all those lists together according to a decision tree and create a unique phenotyping then for each cell. Okay, and then we perform detailed quality checks before we process where there. This creates a whole bunch of data that will be then export, transformed and exported into the database. So we need then to take all these different data sets. Some of these are images, and some of these are label images for the cells, which contain the geometry information about the shapes of the cells. These all have to be transformed into files that can be loaded directly into the database and polygons. Again, this is all this conversion and transformation can be run in fully parallel. It's a, it's a separate little mini workflow, which is basically a big, we represent it as a task. The code conversion is now the, all, all the steps included are 
done in Python in a single Python package, so no more MATLAB licenses. And this also generates the eight layer stitched images, the whole slide images, and also we create the image pyramids for visualization. So, and if, interrupt me anytime, by the way, if you have a question. So then we load the database, and this is this is another fairly significant workflow. This is all written in SQL in SQL. That's the language you program databases. And so we basically still load each of the slides separately. And this is very important in its own little database. And this is very important because we can do all sorts of uh, quality testing, testing for illegal data values, et cetera. And we don't load it into the master warehouse without actually validating every piece of the data item. And in every step of the processing steps, we actually do do a general ledger type checks and balances. So when I move data from, so copy and value added, create value added data from one table to another table, I validate that the correct number of rows have been transferred, etc. Okay. We also generate additional random points. I will talk a little bit more about that later, but it's very important that essentially we create over the good tissue area using, using basically the geometric layout of a slide. We generate actually a uniform distribution of random points with slightly higher than the typical surface density of cells in the sample. And this is something I'm still considering maybe increasing the density to be 10 times higher to minimize counting errors. The purpose of this is if we create a complex geometric selection, this way we can essentially like a buffer around this, uh, the, the tumor boundaries. We can very easily by just by counting the random cells, we can actually assess the same, same the, basically the, the air surface area of that particular selection. Okay, then we, pre -compute, we compute distances from the tumor in regression boundaries, both for the real cells and for the random cells. We pre-compute neighbor's tables, again, for everything. And then this is actually important because if we want to compute neighbor counts, those cells which are near, for example, a selection boundary should be counted with a lower weight because they will have fewer neighbors because half of their neighbor area is outside the region. And this can be correctly es estimated from the random cells. And then we do additional data validation. Once everything is fine, we also then load in the deep zoom image tiles corresponding to the same tiles into this database. So, so basically then we are done with this slide. This can all be done on a separate machine. And, and we can run you know, many virtual machines in parallel. Okay. Then we complete the whole slide database. So we basically load all the slides into the, into the master warehouse, which will be our production, the result of, of the whole process. And this will be the database we will use for the analysis. Then we integrate it with the clinical and calibration data. Then we apply, we create a table that contains the calibrated fluxes. So which we will use for the analysis, but we can always go back to the raw data everywhere. We build extensive spatial indexes to making the additional spatial, spatial searches faster. And we are also building a duplicate sense matches tables, which basically contains the multiple observations of the same objects in the overlap region, which we can again co constantly can use for data validation, whether are the fluxes as accurate as we think they are. Okay, and so that when we when we do this, we basically the finalizing the whole slide database. We actually have to run a calibration of each of the staining batches. We actually store also the information about the microscope characterization, the lens model, and the flat fielding model that all goes into the database. Okay, and this is actually our main workflow. So each of these gray boxes are basically separate tasks. So you can see the one on the left hand, upper left hand corner that I have my mouse over is basically this loop. This we can we have to go around in a loop. 
This is where we characterize the microscope, develop the flat field model. We, we basically measure and test the warping model and iterate until it completely converged. The next step is when we can do it slide by slide, where we apply all these corrections to the images and put them back into the IM3. And then we run the, sorry, and then we run the IM3 through import. And here we have essentially the merge tables is the workflow where we take the different segmentation layers and merge them to create a single coherent catalog. Then we have a wall bit built between this and the rest of the processing. And the only information exchange is through certain data products, which are all value added data products. So these are all the XML files from the image headers that contain the exposures, other parameters, the flat fielded images, image masks. We are actually working, this is not quite done yet, but we try to detect errors in, so like torn tissue, blood vessels, et cetera, which, are auto, which can be automatically tagged and selectively included or excluded from the analysis later on. Or, or a dust spec on the microscope slide, which kind of, uh, you, you can't see anything underneath, et cetera, or out of focus patches. Then we have the component tips, the segmentation results, and then basically the different object catalogs, including the geometries. Okay, so then we perform the transformation where we do the, you know, remember we do the alignment of the overlapping fields. We basically derive the geometries. Then uh, we actually create the stitching. We create the zooms. We create the geometries for every cell. So here we build the polygons from the, from the label images. Then we, we actually take the manual annotations, which were done in Halo, and we actually have to warp them to the, apply all the warping differences between the cupative images that the annotations were done and the final WSI images so that we are within one pixel in the annotations. And then afterwards, we create the deep zoom, deep zoom images. These are the little image tiles that we use for the visualization. And then we build basically a driver file. We scan all these files and build a master file that contains location of every file that needs to be loaded into the database and the tables that they need to be loaded into. And then essentially, we can push a button and then this file will drive the whole database loading and it will automatically load everything, the whole output products of all these things into the, into the database. That's actually a separate little workflow. We do the same thing with the zooms. And this is, let me show you, this is basically, these are all the steps I have to go through in SQL. So, so it's an 18 step workflow plus three for the images. And then, and then this creates an array of sample databases and these are then merged through this workflow basically with the clinical information and with each other. And this creates basically the WSI database. And here I'm putting actually the zooms into a separate database because they don't need to be on so fast disks, as fast disks as, as the database where the searches are. So this is just to save money. So those are on more regular SSDs where the database itself is on something called NBME, where those, those SSDs are of the order of five to 10 times faster. Okay. And so basically I would like to, then uh, talk a little bit about the cell view. I don't know if I if if I had a chance to actually demo it for you on the previous meetings. If not, I would like to take five minutes in the end to do that. But essentially, or maybe I should do it this right now. Uh, either way, up to you. Yeah. So why don't why don't I actually jump into a different screen share? This would be okay because it. Okay, so this is basically an interface. So here we have a bunch of different projects. Each of them contain a lot of slides. You can see on the left. And then, then here we can, we can zoom into the images to very high level. So you can see this quite nicely. But actually what we have is the ability, first of all, to just change the overall intensity of the image if we wanted to highlight. 
but I can change actually the color. I can turn on a particular layer, for example. So this, I'm adding a green color to CD8. Okay, you can start to see, I can turn actually any of the layers on and off. Okay, I can turn off, for example, CD, and I can turn off DEPI as well. So let me just show actually PDR1 and PD1. You can see it, so these are these two layers. But so the whole point is that all the coloring, I have full control over the coloring, but all the big data sitting over the server side. So I'm only transferring the minimum amount of information that is necessary. And it is, it is done in the form of these little tiles. So we are always drawing 256 pixel type tiles. And as I'm zooming in, we actually switch to a different set of tiles with a higher magnification. And as I'm zooming in more and more, we are now at zoom level seven. And now we are at zoom level eight. And it's always the roughly the same number of tiles are shown on the screen. So this is what makes it fast. So I don't have to, when I'm, when I'm zooming in at very high resolution, then I don't have to actually load the whole image, only this part, that part of the image that is visible. And I can still basically change the coloring on demand. So say I do, okay, sux 10, let me paint the sux 10, whatever to red, so that you can see. So you can see that how quickly everything changes. So the whole point is that this is a 100,000 squared image. Okay, then I can actually display the annotations on top. Let me turn off the grid. So this shows the annotation polygons. Okay. And in order to see what is inside and where are holes, for example, so these are the annotations in this particular scene. I can also add, for example, the tumor a little transparency. So you can see, and I can change the transparency. So I can, I can display actually field polygon. And this shows a little better. <laughs> Anyway, so, so that's about the that's about the annotations. Okay, let me leave actually actually let me leave this on. And then we can display now the cells. And let me turn up the images. So this this is actually only the cells. This is again rendered in real time. There are more than a million cells on this. And as you can see, I'm basically as, as we are zooming in more and more, we can display the contours of the nuclei or membranes of, of every cell. And we can, I can still have the image underneath, but I can fade the image in and out, for example, if I wanted to investigate it closer. And for each cell, I have a control, for example, that for the CD8 cells, here I can show, I can pick the color and the way it is displayed, what is the nucleus with fill, this is the boundary of the nucleus. I can set up, for example, a, say a bluish, bluish color for displaying actually the boundary of the nucleus. And then I can also display what is the membrane. And you can see that, that now the, the CD8 cells have a blue boundary of the nuclei, et cetera. So we have a lot of control over this. What is neat altogether that Basically, we also plot these cells in uh, on the tiles, and we I use four different algorithms in the database. So here, here we display the cell outlines and the geometries. As I'm zooming out, we display a discrete little symbol, a circle. Then, as I'm moving out, every cell it becomes a dot, and then later on, in every screen pixel, we have a hundred cells. And so then I'm computing actually the average of cells over each screen pixel to display the color. And this all has to be done basically in, in a fraction of a second. So, so this was quite a bit of, of, of really interesting coding. And the, the last bit is we also have a quick look feature. So if I go somewhere and I find something interesting, okay. If I find something interesting, so here I can click, for example, in this environment, you can see this is zoomed up here. And I have a separate display of, this, of the overlay of the annotation layer and of the images. And I can actually store this in a lab notebook. And this is stored with a whole bunch of other data. And I can go back to you know, previous, I can go back to a completely different project 
So all my presets that I have stored previously, it recalls which slide it was and so on. And, and basically displays all this information. I can also store different presets, different color settings, et cetera. And this can also go into databases. So, so this is what we have done. Oh yes. And one last thing, we can also start drawing our own annotations. So, so that's basically, I can put on an annotation. And this guarantees that it will always be a closed polygon. And I'm not that good at it, but, but you get the idea. Okay, sorry, I blew it, but. Okay, so let me go back to the talk and. Is that gonna, um, is that viewer gonna be available? Kind of oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and, and, Oh, absolutely. And, and I think the, the idea is that, that also once we have it, we linked up to Proxima, then we can, this should be, this should run basically also on the cloud very easily. Great. Um, let's see. So, so right now this can display whatever is in the master database. This, it can be displayed this way. Okay, so, so the new features that we added, for example, the field polygons were really important. This was an annotation error, <clears throat> where in Halo, the annotation, the polygons were not quite close. So the last click was not made and there were some dangling lines and this resulted basically in a bad annotation. This isn't very easy when you just see the lines, but when you fill in the out outlines, then you suddenly see that this is something wrong. Okay. We allow now for an arbitrary number of annotation layers. The, we are starting to do the user-defined polygons, which can be then stored in the databases, provided you actually log into the database, you create a login. And then we have also this gradual fade in and out. So basically I have demoed how we are doing the tiling and how we actually did very clever indexing tricks with bounding boxes of cells and so on to actually make the drawing really, really fast. But uh, the whole point in making the drawing really, really fast on the server side so that you can use essentially any laptop, any browser. You don't need to have a heavy duty desktop to play with this information. Everything happens server side. All that you need is a very, very thin client. Okay, and, and this is again, so how we actually are zooming through the different levels of details. Okay, and the lab notebook, and we will create an Excel export so that you can also export your favorite location. So you don't have to take manual notes, for example, that you saw something either interesting or something on the notes. Okay, so the data analysis development. So, so the random samples are extremely useful for estimating cell density in complex geometries, but also in, when we want to go to correlation functions or more complicated spatial statistical measures. But you know, just to illustrate, so how can we basically pre-compute the cell density in complex geometries that I run two queries. I build a histogram of this, a distance histogram of the real cell count of a particular phenotype. Then I build an identical histogram of random cells within the same selection. And then take the ratio of the two counts and multiply the density with the known surface density of the random cells. This gives me basically the ability to create plots like this. So, so these are the different types of cells basically at the tumor stroma boundary. And we are working on to introducing more advanced spatial statistics and ML tools, but I think probably these are not for the faint-hearted necessarily, but uh, they should be very easy to implement in the site survey, where you can write essentially, we will create, we will give a Python package that enables, contains all the functions to get to the data in the database. And it has also geospatial tools for visualizing all these informations. And we are starting to look at genomics integration with Alex. Um, and this, this is a size server integration where we basically have a platform where people can set up groups where they can share intermediate results with, within the group. Typically a group is like the people working together on a paper. 
and you can do all kinds of analysis, R, Python, you can do relational database queries, and we also have AI tools built in into the whole framework. So you don't have to take data in and out, whatever you with one of the tools, it's accessible and visible for all the other tools. And your data can sit in flat files or it can sit in your own database tables. So it's really very nice. We have currently more than 10,000 people using this actually. So, so I think we, it's scalable. And this would be, for example, a simple Python script that basically accesses the database for the cell data and their expression levels. And it creates a custom colors coded scatter plot, one different, a different symbol for each cell type. And basically we can just plot together. We can even draw the outline, et cetera. So hardware, so after the three cohorts, we are kind of starting to run out of storage space with all the intermediate data. So the intermediate data roughly increases the raw data size by a factor of 10. And then in the database, this collapses to actually about a quarter of the original data or less. But right now we still haven't deleted all this intermediate data, but eventually we safely can delete much of that because it's reproducible. We always back up the raw data very carefully. But nevertheless, we purchased a four petabyte storage system. It's right now half populated and in use, and soon we will fill it up with disks. We added several new processing nodes. Currently, we actually got our hands on, on a decommissioned HPC cluster with 52 nodes, which was not fast enough for fluid dynamics, but I think it will be perfectly fine for doing the parallel image processing. And we added a swarm cluster management so that we can submit to an arbitrary machine, essentially. So the, we don't even know where the job is going to run on this cluster. We are adding a high-end quad server with the most up-to-date CPUs with a two terabyte of memory and 128 cores. And we will soon add two extra database nodes. So right now our database node is a single point of failure. We only have one of those. And if that fails, then we are in deep trouble. So I would like to have actually three replicas altogether. And this is what I'm working on now is how to do. So basically as we scale up, it's, it's getting harder and harder to keep track of what is where. We write logs, but it's uh, cumbersome. So we need a real time system. And so let me just show kind of the vision that we would have a high level view where this every one of the rows is here, basically one cohort. Okay, and, and then here are the main levels. So what has been stained and scanned and et cetera, and what has been loaded into the whole slide database. If I click on any one of these cohorts, it will show the same set of state of tasks, but broken down to the individual slides. If I click on any one of these high level tasks, it will show actually what are the sub steps within the task and what has been processed, what is running, what is dead or failed. And then if I click on any of these cells, I can see all the detailed log messages, which can be, there can be a hundred messages per cell. But in a sense, if I look at the high level screen, I can already see, you know, where, what is the status of thousands of slides potentially. So, so this, is, this is the goal. Current data, we have three cohorts, 235 slides, 84,000 HPFs, 220 million detected cells. Of these, 97, are, 97 million are unique. In the neighbor's table, we have 3.5 billion neighbor relations pre-computed. We have 8.7 trillion pixels. And Cliff alluded to this. So the whole Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that was $200 million in 20 years, we processed 5 trillion pixels. So, so I'm actually pretty proud of what we accomplished with this. And we already have about another 200 slides already scanned and they are in different stages of processing. But I don't have this beautiful overview picture yet. So, and these are, these are all the people who work on this. So, and, and also I'd like to acknowledge we were getting lots of support from Akoya and also from the Mark Foundation, besides all the federal funding. So please shoot questions. 
Awesome. So as, as you know, we've been dying to use this system because yeah. we've been suffering through a lot of the analysis that you've automated, and um, we, you yeah. know, we believe that this is a really good yeah. solution. So I understand that largely uh, you've completed the transition um, from MATLAB to Python, but yeah. that um, you're also kind of on hold maybe for the science paper to be released. Is that the well? So paper? so basically, we are the writing the documentation is still ongoing so i think much of this thing is already in an open github repository i think this is still kind of hidden by obscurity but 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 we then have to actually lock the whole thing for the science paper i think that's one of the conditions of science but we will keep the the open repository as a parallel where we put the up to the updates constantly we want to do the locking in the last possible moment because the documentation is evolving every day. And it's very painful to write all these detailed docs. So yeah. So but but you know, if you if you want to start playing with some of the things, we are actually happy to to give you a walk you through it. Yeah, that, that, Chris, I'm just wondering if some of the you know slides that have been generated by us could be used by you, you know, I, I, I joined late, but that would be uh -huh. used. Well, you read my mind, Chris. I was going to say the JPL already has a lot of our images, you know, that we have uploaded. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you access them, Alex? And just see. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so for our framework to work nicely. So we created basically a file hierarchy where for each slide, there is a directory tree. With a particular layout, so that we can, uh, so that we can drive the uh, that drives the automation, and this is all actually documented now in, in already on GitHub. So if you could could actually package those directories, so th so that is a painful thing to do this by hand. If if the data is packaged in the right way, then then we can run the workflows pretty automatically. But it, but there are certain naming conventions for what what should be in each directory, et cetera. So so that needs to be adhered. So I think this is not very far from the way Akoya does. So the raw data is very much simply following the Akoya layouts. But then we added a couple of additional things how we represent the different metadata. But but that's that's really there is to it. So you mentioned metadata. That's something I, I really wanted to dig down on too, because as we go into what we need to do, um, there is quite a bit of metadata that would need to be tied to this. And I, I wonder what your vision for how to deal with, you know, we're going to have everything from um, from genomics data to uh -huh. clinical outcome data and treatment mm -hmm. data and so forth. Um, what's the best way to kind of simultaneously handle that? Or is it just a link or a pass off? Well, so, you know, some of the, so much of the metadata is derived from the Akoya image headers and the XML files, which is the scanning plan and, and so on and the geometry layout. What is one big chunk that is coming externally is the manual annotation right now. The, yeah. way, the way we do it currently, it is that we take the QPT file and then, then it's annotated manually, and unfortunately by different people. So sometimes they spell tumor and good tissue with capital G and, and small t, others spell it with capital capital, others spell it with lowercase. Then other people call the tumors malignant region and so on. So, so there has to be a consistency. So we actually like to, to we are trying to enforce a dictionary for the annotation layer names. Yeah. So, so that we, we basically shout, shout bloody murder if the name is in, not on our dictionary and then it needs to be added. This is not a big deal. So in a sense, in an annotation file, one can go in with a text editor and change it. But, but we would prefer if it was not done by us because it's in a sense, we don't really know the hidden meaning behind those words. So right, right. malignant may mean a different thing right. for one pathologist than for the other. Yeah, so we have we have a, a, the same problem as we expand the metadata from the metadata that you're talking about, which is directly mm -hmm. associated with the image uh, to the uh, metadata that is now associated with the origin of that image, which is a patient, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So we have the same problem though that we've yeah. been trying to solve. And yeah, the additional metadata involves what all paths were used for the different layers, what were the batches, and for each chemical batch, it is done, I think, in by like 24 slides at the same, same time. And out of in each batch, we try to contain a calibration slide, which is uh, consisting of, at this point, we started with 24 TMAs, and uh, now we have 120 TMA uh, yeah. cores. And that's a wide cross section between different issue types. So that actually gives a very good, a very good calibration set to establish the consistency between batch and batch. We also, if we had to replace a light bulb in the microscope that changed the flat field, so we call that a separate batch, even if the chemistry. So basically every major life, lifetime event in the, in the life of the microscope is a, is, is a change. So with all that in mind, it, it, it strikes me that you are, um, a lot of that is very specific to um, the stainer and the microscope, but that the same kind of analysis you presented here could be applied to a completely different method for producing yeah. uh, multi-spectral or multi-layer. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. No, for example, we are we already also demonstrated I was able to take slides from Angelo or, or data from Angelo who actually used the flatbed, I think as size scanner. Right. Or, or a flatbed scanner, and then just washing out the different stains and then registering them in Halo and creating the segmentation in Halo. And I was able to load it into the same database schema. And even a different number of layers. So, so, so these, these are the things which are of course evolving and, and with every new kind of data set, we are learning something new. Yeah, so I'm sure. <laughs> And we're going to be right there with you, uh, learning as we go. Um, it looks like uh, Richard has his hand up, so I'll call yeah, him I do. Out. Thank, thank and, you. And the and the floor is open for questions. Yeah. So amazing stuff. I have two and a half questions. The first one and a half questions is, what can you? I, I'm sure you've discussed this before, but what was the uh, inspiration from astronomy, and how has that sort of bled into this uh, thing? And then related to that, there's another different field, which is GIS, Gra uh, Geographical Information yeah, Systems. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering if any of that, you know, basically looking at the impact of McDonald's locations on home prices. Yes, um, and, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. And my third question, just so I don't forget, is um, what about image enhancement, AI and image enhancement, sharpening, and all, you know, super resolution, all the other stuff. Yeah, okay. So one, astronomy, I think the number one lesson was that when it comes to the analysis, using a single database is much better than using 100,000 flat files. So, so that's just not scalable. And the other is, is lesson learned, if I wanted to restrict only to two, that scaling, scaling out is really hard. And we have to automate as much as possible. So whenever a human is involved, there will be mistakes. No, no, you know, the only question is when and how often. And so, so we need to get maximally away from human involvement. It is easier to do in astronomy than I think in, in cancer biology because of all the staining, et cetera. But, but nevertheless, I think we have actually gone a long way to, to formalize and automate some of these processes. And, and so, so standardization makes it much less likely that people make an inconsistent mistake. And then the other is that never trust anything coming from the previous step of the processing, always validate. So this is what this whole idea in the general ledger is that you know, incoming, outgoing, incoming, outgoing, and they have to match. So, so that, that these were kind of the astronomy lessons. And of course, we basically, all this flat fielding and image warping are kind of standard things that we do every the beginning of every night on the telescope and then the end of every night of the telescope to take a flat field image because those things are changing and drifting. So, Okay, next question was GIS. Yeah, so everything in the database is GIS polygons. We are using GIS standards. So, so essentially the whole framework that is deep underneath 
is essentially the same framework that is used by speed maps. And, and this is how we do the tiling. The tilings exactly adhere to the standards that Google Map is using and so on. And we did our own image mixing, the color mixing, et cetera, that is custom. But, but basically such a way we could use a lot of open source software altogether. And when we go to Python and SciServer and the custom code, again, in my cancer container that contains all the code I need, I have basically all the GIS tools in there as well. To, if I wanted to draw the, and wanted to compute intersections, intersection areas, et cetera. Oh, what was the third question? Because ah, I <laughs> forgot. Actually, just going back to GIS, there's sort of the infrastructure of GIS, but there's also maybe the inspiration of how the data is displayed, uh, how the yeah. user interacts with it. There, I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's a rich and, and visually intriguing environment. Yeah, yeah, you know, this is why we trust started to use the field polygons and all those things. And, and it was kind of easy using the GIS tools. So yeah, absolutely. And, and when we do even more complicated spatial statistics, I think this will be, this will be increasingly more important. Sure. And the, the other thing I think you already touched on was uh, AI for sharpening and super resolution. Yeah, content. yeah, so, so we haven't gone there so far. So, it's conceivable that one could one could actually improve the quality of the images. So so absolutely, that that is something one could do. Uh, let's see. So I think still there. Is, so one interesting thing that we we can do with the displaying the outlines of the segmented images. So I can kind of do things like as what what how would the sky look like if, if I could turn up all the stars in the Milky Way. So that I can only see, for example, just the immune cells, which, which is kind of you can do with switching the marker layers on and off, but we can do much better after the segmentation. And I think this will be particularly important when we start to do the multiple slices. So we are starting to do 3D images because if we wanted to display all the cells and all the image layers, it would get incredibly busy. If I only want to show, for example, the relation of the immune cells or the CD163s, then each image contributes basically a little cluster of dots, but it will be much more sparse. So we should be able to recognize spatial structure when we can turn, turn certain pieces of the information on and off at will. And just a, just a follow-up. <clears throat> I mean, the, the data complexity that you have on a single image is horrendous. Uh, how are you going to a, a? How are you going to manage with three D images? And B, uh, how are you getting those? Are they light sheet or multiple slices, or what's the deal? Well, so right now I think what we what we would have is adjacent cuts, mm -hmm. and and then I think here the only thing that we don't have right now is the ability. So we need to introduce one extra processing steps to have the absolute zero point of to be that we can adjust the absolute zero points after loading things into the database because every slide is still processed separately, completely. And then, so, so the zero point is whatever the microscope gives us. And, but then if I wanted to display two layers on top of each other, I can, I can we, we need to be able to move actually set the zero point, the position of zero point of the second, et cetera. Synchron, we have to pick one of the slides, which will be the reference for all the adjacent layers. I can see very easily how we can step, be able to step through one by one, for example, to do a fly through the layers. I haven't thought much about actually, other than also trying to do this 3D, so doing a three dimensional rotation of multiple layers, but turning at not showing images, but showing the segmentation results. So maybe each, each layer, each cell in each layer would be like a little disk. And then if, if the layers are five microns thick, then as we should be able to see the same cell in two or three layers still potentially if it's a bigger cell so that they would show like three ad adjacent cuts of a little ball. And we could rotate the around in 3D if the number of cells is not too large. In 3D displaying a million cells in and real time flies through that kind of starts to push computing a little. Thanks. Do you envision do you envision that kind of um, serial section registration 
to incorporate um, some sort of a barometer for when they don't register well. So to tell you that um, this data is not available or is not co-registered properly. Well, yeah. yeah. So, so this is, by the way, what what some of yeah. So we are already are faced with this. In some cases, we do see actually even torn tissues between the or or errors between the cupative and the uh, when the cupative was imaged with the broadband filters and and when we build the the alignment, the stitching of the narrow band. So, so yeah. So we will represent those as masks, error masks, essentially. Which we can either ignore or use at will. Right. But, right, but well, we're definitely ready to get started with this, Alex. So we're going to be helping you uh, troubleshoot all the next steps as we uh, yeah. do this yeah. product. It's awesome. Cool. Uh, and, 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 questions. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, can you send us a GitHub location or we'll, we'll look for that? Oh, okay. So, uh, why don't I, I, I will dig it out and send it to Alex and then you can okay. share it. Yeah, that's perfect, sure, thank sure, you. Sure, sure, Yeah, well, it's great. very exciting, it's wonderful. Yeah, to see the code is complex enough that I, I don't think it will be easy just to download and start using it, but you can get a feel for it. And then if you are really ready to get engaged then talk to us and then, then, then we will walk you through. I, I think and there's we, gonna be, I, I, I'm speaking for Sudhir because I'm not sure he's on. So um, I think there's going to be an emphasis to, you know, you, you've you stood up a uh, useful server for this type of data um, mm -hmm. at Hopkins. And there's going to be, I think, an interest from NCI in either expanding that and mm -hmm. opening it to more NCI users or creating mm -hmm. a new instance. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I don't know what the best choice would be. I think my best, my favorite choice would be just have the NCI sponsor opening it up to more investigators mm -hmm. and letting you continue to grow it and manage yeah. it. Yeah, um, sounds but, good. Um, but I think that that's going to be part of the next level of discussion here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we can work out also, so we can work with JPL to figure out how can we create a kind of an, an, an data export plugin yeah. that, that, that we can actually download the data by which would be automatically materialized in the right format, in the right layout in the directories. That shouldn't be that shouldn't be really that difficult. So so would you think that um, that it would be useful for JPL to set up a, a, a similar uh, petabyte server? Instance. Yeah, but if they already have the data there, so if, if we create the right export tools, that would work. But if we do actually some of the processing over on the JPL side and, and I only get the things that I need to load into the database, that's all the better. So that might be, that might require moving much less data that way. So that, that, might, right. be, that might be a good way to go. So, so we should- All right, we'll, we'll be talking about that. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, other questions for Alex? Now's your chance, people. He's going to be famous with the science paper coming out in a few weeks. <laughs> we won't be able to get him on the phone anymore. He'll be talking <laughs> to the New York Times. <laughs> All right. Without further questions, I'm going to I'm going to let us move on. We have one more speaker today.